take care of the facilities. I talked to him yesterday, and uh, he said his mother is uh, uh, stage three, almost stage four cancer, and they're afraid to do the surgery. They're afraid to make the cancer spread. So I told her, told him that we keep her on the prayer list. Okay, that's Tammy Dag. Uh, stage three or stage four uh, cancer. Who else? Any reports on Brenda? <coughs> uh, I haven't heard anything, uh, Lord, good morning, brother. Uh, Brendan Jones, anyone have an update on Brendan? He, I know he's finished with his cancer treatment and recovering uh, the last I heard on Wednesday. So by all means, keep Brendan, Natasha, and Aubrey in your prayers for a full and complete recovery and, a, and, a, and an eradication of that cancer. Um, anyone else before we go to God in prayer? Right, well, let's bow and go to God in prayer this morning. Our most righteous, loving, heavenly Father, hallowed be your great and glorious name. We praise you and honor you as the only true and the living God, the giver and sustainer of life, the creator of all things, uh, the one who upholds the very existence and the power of your mighty hand. And, and we thank you for for creating us and for loving us to provide a way back to your good favor even though we sinned and separated ourselves from from you you provided the way back through your son and our savior jesus christ who came to this earth lived a perfect life shed his sinless blood to cover our sins and we know it's through him that we can come before you at this time giving you uh, the praise and honor and thanksgiving uh, due to, to you, the only true and the living God. Father, we are mindful of many of our number that, that we mentioned this morning. Uh, we pray for, the, for Brendan Jones. Father, we pray for a full and complete uh, recovery from, uh, from his cancer treatments, we pray that you will eradicate that cancer from his body and you will give him uh, complete wellness. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, uh, Jim Mullins, who is undergoing some difficulties right now with his heart and gallbladder. And we pray for, for him and we pray for Elfie during this time. We pray that you will, uh, that you will work uh, through through those doctors and nurses or, or in, in whatever manner you, you choose to work to, to give him health and wellness, Father. We're thankful to hear about Troy's mother, Sharon, being back home, and we pray for a full recovery for her, as well as for Billy Ray Keelan following his successful surgery. We thank you for that, uh, for seeing him uh, safely through that procedure and pray for for a full and speedy recovery for him. Father, be with Tammy Dagnan, who is in is in uh, advanced cancer. Father, we just pray for her. We pray uh, that you'll give her wellness and comfort according to your will. Father, we pray for Allison Mitchell as she uh, has her C-section surgery scheduled this Wednesday. We pray for a successful surgery for her and health for her and that baby. And, we pray for that family uh, as they raise that child. Um, Father, we pray for others uh, that, that haven't mentioned you know each one, you know their needs. Father, we pray that you will bless them according to their needs, and it's our prayer that you will restore them back to health. Father, we thank you for this period of Bible study. We pray uh, for Jose as he teaches us this morning. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Ken. <laughs> yes, Appreciate you taking up my slide. I uh, oh. not an excuse, but just uh, tell you what what I've been up to. Andrew and I had to uh, chaperone the uh, the spring formal that 
the school where I teach. And it's quite an interesting uh, study in anthropology. Uh, it's funny about these kids today. I, I just don't understand. I sound like an old, because you know, I am. But, uh, well, you were never one. Well, I was never one. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but it's just, it's just hilarious to me. We were laughing last night uh, because uh, our, our principal has referred to is what they do today is actually not a dance, it's more of a tribal ritual. And uh, and it's true, I mean, you know, they spend so much time doing this, I don't think they know how to talk to each other. They walk in with a date, and then the next thing you know, they all stand around like this until finally the music gets to them. Then they all go to the floor together, circle up, and they start jumping around. <laughs> It's, yeah, look, it's a tribal dance. He's right. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, just, I apologize for being a few minutes late. Um, I will say this as a form of confession. Daryl Walter would be proud of the time I made between. <laughs> so all I'm going to say, if there's any police officers in the uh, in, in present meeting, I, I apologize. For being you can take that as a confession. Uh, the theme for the year is <clears throat> who do you say I am? Uh, Mark 8, 27. Um, we see precisely what I'm talking about. Does someone read Mark 8? Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on his way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do you who do people <coughs> say that I am? And then of course uh, we read on verse 28. They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And then he repeated it. He said, But who do you say I am? Verse 20, <coughs> here I answered in verse 30. Oh, well, in verse 29, he said, You are the Christ. That is probably not something we need to toss around in here. Obviously, you're here on Sunday morning. It's pretty obvious who you say he is. Oh, uh, there's our, our greeters coming in. Thank you for doing that. Um, we, we talked a little bit the last couple of weeks about Jesus, the man, Jesus, the historical figure. We established that Jesus. Uh, it's not only something we can you know, but what do you say when you talk to scoffers you know it's, it seems very um, simple to us to pull out the Bible and explain it from the word of God because we believe it's the word of God what about the scoffers who say I don't believe in that this is no better than you know the Iliad or you know, talking about the gods of Greece or whatever other mythical tome you want to talk about. Um, but yet, you know, we established in the last two weeks that there's no doubt he was real. There was plenty of historical, one of the most recorded lies in history was that of our Savior Jesus Christ. So we established over and over again his staunchest opponents wrote about it. Um, we established that he lived for certain, that he died, that he died by crucifixion, that he died in the reign of a particular emperor. He was born in the reign of a particular emperor. All of this recorded by people who opposed him. So there's no doubt as far as how the accuracy of our, what we call the Word of God matches up with the historical records as far as the, the fact that Jesus lived and Jesus died. 
Now comes the sticking point. The resurrection. Is he the resurrected Christ? Obviously, we believe it. We believe this is the truth. <clears throat> but there's no denying that there, there's no denying anyone can make that he lived and he died. That's historical fact. So, what do you say to a scoffer? Um, there are probably there was plenty of, of prominent people in the history of the world who have lived and died. And there's plenty of prominent people who had, I'd say probably anybody if you dig deep enough, who had controversial aspects of their life that they were prominent. And some of them, people have written things about them to try to refute some part of their life. I don't believe there's anybody in the history of the world where so much has been written to try to refute what happened in his death and then life after death as Jesus Christ. There's so much. Why has there been so much? That's, that's the question I would ask a scholar. Why has there been so much writing and debating and speech making about this man's life, his death, and especially his resurrection? Why so much has been written to try to refute his resurrection? Um, why has there been so much time uh, spent trying to refute this? Um, the first action, think about it. What was the first action of the Jewish leaders that opposed him as soon as he was crucified? Well, they said his disciples came and took him from the grave. Yeah, but what was the first? Yeah, they did. But what was the first step they took? They went to ask to seal the tomb. They went to Pilate and, and asked to seal the tomb and do what? Post guard. Post a guard. Very first thing. Because they knew the prophecy. They knew what he had been telling everybody was going to happen. Um, and um, it, it's interesting that that this was the very first step they took. If he's such a myth, if he's such a lie, if he's such a deceiver, why are you this worried? Now, does anybody know about, just historically, the Roman soldiers that were posted in, in Galilee at that time, in Judea, I'm sorry, at that time? These were, what, what Pilate had there was a portion, he didn't have the whole legion, but he had a portion of the 10th legion of Rome. If you don't know about the 10th legion, the 10th legion was one of the most elite units in the Roman army. They were the guardians of the eastern border. The eastern border of the empire was Parthia, the Parthian Empire. The Parthian Empire was one of the biggest enemies of Rome and one of the biggest threats they had at that time. They weren't gonna put you know, a so-so legion over there. They needed some serious bloody killers. Brutal. You know, some of the best of the best at what they did. What they did was kill. They were they were not just any legion. Uh, these soldiers that they put there. So, what's the first lie? You already mentioned it, Brother David. The first lie that was concocted and spread among the people. His disciples. His disciples. Get his body still in the way. Okay. It almost borders on the ridiculous to think about that line. When you think in terms of the fact that this was the members of the 10th Legion. If you let me just tell you a little bit more about the 10th Legion. The 10th Legion was established by Julius Caesar. It was one of the legions established by Julius Caesar. Uh, I believe it was Julius Caesar. Or it might have been, might have been Augustus. But anyway, it doesn't matter. No, it was uh, it was Augustus. Okay. Um, so not not Julius Caesar, but Augustus. 
but they were involved in every war, civil war the Roman Empire had. had. Um, so if you're if you're thinking about before the birth of Christ, they'd already been in the wars against Pompey. They fought in Pompey's rebellion. Then they fought in Mark Anthony and Cleopatra's rebellion. And then they fought, they went east and fought the Parthians several times. So the guys who were the leaders of the of this legion, so the, the officers by now, basically had cut their teeth fighting other members of other legions, Roman legions, the best of the best, the best soldiers of the time. So these guys were hardened veterans. They weren't going to let anything pass. Do you know what the penalty was for disobeying an order? Death. Death. Not just death. Death by bludgeoning <clears throat> with war clubs by your own peers. So the same soldiers. Um, this is, again, not a big deal in terms of Roman discipline. If you disobeyed, if you well, fall asleep was disobedience at your post. Uh, if you deserted, if you caused rebellion amongst the troops, the punishment was death by bludgeoning, by your own peers. Uh, I don't think most people would lie knowing that that was going to be their end. Um, interesting that this was the lie that they were telling the soldiers to me. Other scoffers will tell you, yeah, but these weren't Roman soldiers. There's history, there, there's arguments about whether or not they were real Romans. These, these could have been Jewish conscripts into the Roman army, which the Roman army did. That every legion in the Roman army had foreigners, had, had detachments of foreigner, of foreign uh, troops that they then took in and trained. Uh, otherwise, there weren't enough people in the Italian peninsula to fill out all the legions that were going to have to take all this stuff right here and control it. So they had to take foreigners as they conquered them, as they co-opted them into the Roman uh, Empire. Then, you know, people went into the army and trained, even if they were Jewish. You were under the discipline of the Roman Empire. Because some people will argue, well, these were Jewish soldiers that would have let these up. I don't care if they were they were from Mars, you know. My punishment for letting you take that body is getting bludgeoned to death. I don't think so. That doesn't that doesn't wash, does it? Uh, the other thing, <laughs> what did they ask? What did what did the uh, priest ask for? A guard. A guard is, according to what I've read, every bit of, of uh, information that I could get on Roman army <coughs> organizational uh, numbers from that time, it's, it's a cohort of 16. So this is 16 hardened veterans of the Roman army. That's like saying that me and Danny, Kitty, a couple more of you guys, David. We're going to arm ourselves with the best thing we can find in our house. You know, whether it's a shotgun or a rifle or something. And we're going to go up against 16 special forces guys to take away the body of Jesus. Good luck to us. So you actually believe, because another story is that they were overcome by his disciples. These guys have been fighting the Parthian Empire. And now... A bunch of fishermen, tax collector, a couple of zealots with knives and swords are going to come up and take, just take down 16 members of the 10th Legion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I believe that. Don't you? It makes perfect sense. And leave them alive. And leave them alive. <laughs> Where were the wounds? Where were the dead guys? You know, they had to surrender, right? Makes sense. Um, it, it's just it it, it it just baffles the imagination to think of the lengths that they went to to discredit Jesus 
and what he he had just done. So what he had just done is produce the empty tomb that makes our belief different than anybody else's. Everybody else's leaders are buried, still buried, very buried. And if you go to their graves, you can dig up their bones or what's left of their bones. Not too. I was watching a video the other day on the uh, recovery of uh, the body of King Richard III of England, and uh, watch the ceremony. Nobody does pomp, and but this is not part of the lesson. But nobody does pomp and circumstance like the Brits. Okay, I, I'll say this: it was it was a very impressive, although kind of ironic, um, funeral because uh, you know they, this was a a uh, funeral conducted for a medieval king um, in a Anglican cathedral by Anglican priest. He was a Catholic, so it was, okay. and it was, this was a religion that didn't even exist when he was killed because it was created by the son of the guy whose army killed him. So, <laughs> so it, it, you know, the, the, the irony was just incredible, but but it was a great show, though. It was a fantastic show. I enjoyed that funeral you know, more than any funeral I've ever seen. It was great. It was great. I love pop and surf. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll be it up. I love the choir, too. Anyway, back to this. But, uh, um, so the priestly lie. So he was stolen from the tomb while the soldiers slept. We pretty much put that on the bed, right? Um, and you can read that in the Gospels. Pretty much accurately told as the, it's told in the extra biblical uh, historical accounts. The Gospels tell us exactly what the priest did, what the lie was, and that's exactly the same lie that you read about in the extra biblical accounts. This is what the priest say. So the Bible does not try to embellish or make them out to be the bad guys or anything, just simply reporting something that we don't get in our news today. I digress. Um, <clears throat> so we established what the punishment was. Um, we established the likely or possibility of a bunch of everyday citizens taking up arms and overcoming a guard of 16 trained warriors of the Roman Empire. Um, so then you go to the written lies. There's one called the Toledoth Yeshu. And I'm not going to bore you with the length. It's very lengthy. I'm not going to bore you with the uh, all the detail of it. The core, what's at the core of the lie about Jesus? Because this is the same one I read. I think I read some of it last week. Uh, and, you know, they called him an illegitimate or, or, or bastard uh, um, born to a woman who had been set out or thrown out uh, in divorce for her, um, for, for her infidelity, which, of course, we know. It's even a lie. It puts the lie to their own religion. Because what was the punishment for infidelity in the Jewish religion? Stoning. Death by stoning. Not just death of the woman, but death of both people. They claim that this guy, Joseph Pantera, was the uh, was a soldier, a Jewish a soldier of Jewish ethnicity but a soldier of the Roman army was the guilty party. Well, if that were the case, even though he was a Roman soldier, because he committed a, a, um, a crime against Jewish religion, the Roman army would probably just, because his penalty was going to be probably at the very least what happened to Jesus before the crucifixion, which was <clears throat> for doing that because the Romans didn't want to start political trouble with the Jews or with anybody else. So if you went beyond the limits, and let me mention that infidelity 
you know, we see a lot of stuff in the movies about the Roman Empire very being very uh, lascivious, if you will. But actually, they had some very strict rules about that their moral code was relatively strict, especially about marriage. So if there was infidelity, and especially the kind of infidelity that this would have been, which would have caused a problem with the Jews, uh, at the very least, he was going to get flogged. Probably worse. They were probably going to just send him, okay, you're a Jew, go to your people and let them punish you the way they, that you should be punished, which of course would have been what? Stoning. So, that's the first line. But then this writing goes on to say he went on to Egypt. He hired out because his mother was destitute. We know that's not true. And he acquired magical powers in Egypt that he was very proud of and came back. <clears throat> then on, it's interesting because those same writings later <clears throat> also claim that Jesus somehow... And has anybody ever heard? Let me stop right there for a minute. I got enough time. Anybody heard of this mystical kind of thing that exists in Jewish religious culture called the Kabbalah? It's kind of where all this comes from. Okay? Um, which is basically all it is is a lot of the beliefs that they acquired by mingling with the pagans. Okay, this is where that came from. And so this belief in magical powers and all this. And they one of the one of the Jewish priests wrote, and I think it was the same guy, yeah, I believe it was Philadelphia issue, writing about Jesus and how he came about performing all these great uh, miracles, was that he had somehow acquired he had stolen the ineffable name from the temple, cut his arm open, put the writing in his arm, and so he could use the name to do the, the magic. It was just some crazy uh, mixed up story about how he came about all this. And with the same breath, they're, they're also saying that he acquired the magical powers in Egypt. So which is it, you know? Um, and then as to his death and resurrection, the rabbi wrote this. He was stolen by a gardener and buried it in sand under running water. Okay. So here's the, here's the question. When does the church, when is the church established? According to our writings. The day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Holy the Holy Spirit came upon them. The apostles began to preach. Everyone understood, regardless of what language they spoke, everyone understood there was a miracle that took place. And then what was the result of that? A mass conversion, right? Probably the largest mass conversion that we know of. I've never read of one bigger, have you? Except in Acts, there were other bigger mass conversions. What was the central point of Peter's preaching, of everybody else's preaching, that caused these mass conversions? <laughs> the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that the tomb was empty. This is why there was so much effort to try to squash that. Remember when I read about all those historians talking about the church? What was the one little thing that you kept hearing about? You know, this evil, uh, godless um, superstition kept doing what? Popping up. And it kept squashing it and it kept popping up. And it kept squashing it and it kept popping up. Why? Because they were preaching the very same message that was preached from the very beginning, which was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ, the resurrected Savior. That's who he is. Um, and they can't deny it. Uh, why not produce the body? You know, the simplest thing would have been because who did Peter preach to? What did he say? 
Who did he who did he point at when he said crucified? The Jews. You crucified. Yes, and and in the writings, like even in the Toledot uh, Yeshu that I mentioned here, they they admit they say we crucified him, we hung him on the tree. You know, we know the Romans did it, but they did it for them in proxy. So even the Jewish priests who write this stuff, okay, <laughs> and, and this is you know to this day this is what's being what, what, what's being taught because. A lot of these writings are part of what's known as the Talmud, which exists to this day. It's the writings, the opinions of the early rabbis post destruction of the temple. Okay, and, and they read this as interpretations of the law. And so the stories and everything in there are still read um, and taught uh, in that religious uh, order. Um, says that the gardener took the body. I thought the disciples took the body. See what the, the contradictions there. The first thing that you're going to hear from scoffers is what? Oh, the Bible does what to itself? Contradicts. Contradicts itself. You can find a thousand contradictions to the arguments in opposition of the Bible. And the so called contradictions, I'll mention some of it next week. It, it, they're not contradictions at all, but there's scoffers from the very beginning about the resurrected Christ. There's scoffers from recent times, 1965, the Soon Theory. Everybody's heard of that one, haven't you? Anybody here not heard of the Soon Theory? The Soon Theory. Uh, this was um, an interesting one. According to the gentleman who wrote the Sun Theory and produced it in 1965. Jesus was not dead. He fainted, basically went into a mini coma from the trauma. You know, trauma induced coma. I've seen it, it happens. And then when placed upon the cold stone slab, he, he eventually revived. You know, it slowed down the process of death enough for the body to repair itself enough so that he would be revived and then he could come out of the tomb. That's great. That's wonderful attempt. Unfortunately, unfortunately, what are we dealing with here? He was flawed first. It was called a near death. These Roman soldiers were really good at it. They were the NFL players of their time. They trained for one thing, and that's to do harm to anything and anybody that opposed the Roman Empire. And they were real good at doing harm. Don't believe it. All of that belonged to them because they were good at doing harm. Um, to believe that someone would get their muscles, their blood vessels, their tendons, their ligaments ripped off the cage that we call the skeleton. Have the blood loss that took place there. Then hung on a cross, if you don't know crucifixion, and it's a very interesting study if you ever read of the, the actual anatomical changes that take place with crucifixion. It's basically a very slow, excruciating form of asphyxiation. You choke to death. Okay? So to believe that someone would be just completely demolished from in the upper torso, lose all the fluids, Lose all the faculties of any muscle in the outer portion of this cage, which these are the ones that are involved in helping you breathe to begin with. So you're already having trouble breathing before they hand you on the cross. Yes, sir. Well, then they pierced him with the sword. Well, yeah, that's where I was coming. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so to believe that that isn't enough, the guy's already short of breath. Our Savior is already in severe blood loss, which is enough to kill you all by itself. Think about it. If you suffer third degree burns over the this portion of your body, your chances of survival are almost zero. I'm telling you this from a medical perspective, I haven't been involved with trauma treatments for many years before I became a teacher. 
All right. So we get there. And then you're going to tell me he's going to hang on a cross for as many hours as we're told that he hung on a cross where he is experiencing asphyxia very slowly, dehydration, frying under the sun. He's already dehydrated because he's bled half his body contents of fluid out. And then lastly, we read that he gives up the spirit. He they didn't kill him. He willingly gave up the spirit according to the word that we believe to be the word of God. But even after that, then a soldier took either a sword or a spear, doesn't matter, a sharp object, and did something that soldiers did very regularly in those days. And they were very good at it. You thrust through the ribs into the vital organs. Aiming towards the center, you know, catch the heart, hopefully rip a, a lung, maybe a liver on the way in. It was from the right side, so I'm guessing it got the liver. He was hanging up here, so it was probably upward, either with a sword or a spear. So if it went through the ribs here, it went through the liver. Maybe caught the right lung, definitely caught the left lung when it went all the way through, and pierced the heart. And he went into shock. <laughs> If, if you assume, yeah, let's assume the guy is right. Yeah. So, so even if he's right, why is he wrong? Well, if he passes out, he's going to asphyxiate in a minute, in a, in a matter of four minutes. Absolutely. All right. Yes. Less than that. Less than that. And then, coupled with the, the you know, the heart is pierced mm -hmm. because it's a mixture because it's the pericardium sac that's pierced because there's blood and water that comes out. Right, that's where I was going next. Thank you. <laughs> we have five minutes, so let me see if I can wrap this up. The resurrected Christ, he is the resurrected Christ, he is who we say he is. Uh, they can't produce a body, we've established that. They just they, they come up with all kinds of lies because the body was never they were never able to produce a body. The simplest way to squash the church of Christ from the very beginning. Peter's preaching, you crucified him, and he's now risen from the dead. Here's the body. What do you mean he's risen from the dead? Church over. Right? Why? Why didn't, didn't they do that? Because they couldn't. Because the tomb was empty. Um, they knew he was dead because they didn't do what they normally do. That's break the legs. Right. And that's why they pierced the body. And, and the, the soldier did something that they did to all dead bodies on a battlefield after a battle they would go around people were assigned this duty and this happened all the way to the 19th century how do i know that because my grandfather did in the war that you all know as the spanish american war it went on for 10 years before that it was the war of independence of cuba from spain my grandfather fought in that war he was a captain in that war and on several on several occasions when they won the battle, the, the, the winning side would walk the battlefield and put the wounded down to shorten their suffering. Because you couldn't take prisoners because there wasn't enough food for, for the, the, their own side, let alone beating a bunch of prisoners. The Spanish did it, the Cubans did it. So I know it happens. Um, I remember that story vividly from when I was a little kid, uh, my dad telling me that. But anyway, um, so he basically did, you know, it was just a kindness. Remember, the soldiers were impressed by what happened. Remember, we talked about the darkness. We talked about the earthquake. They were impressed, but they did him a kindness. Well, the centurion was impressed, too. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but he was definitely already dead, or they would have broken a leg. That was the, that was the classic move to speed up the asphyxiation because the only thing they could do to stay alive because all the weight of the of the, the contents of your gut were pushing up on your diaphragm and squeezing the air out of your lungs as you hung there. And the only thing you could do is push up on your feet, which were nailed or tied, which is a very painful thing to do, and push up and push up. You break the legs, it can't push up anymore. They asphyxiate very quickly. All right, so 
just to finish. I want to read a couple of things and then we'll be done. Yeah, I got enough time. So, there's a quote circulated by Jews concerning the empty tomb. It was quoted by Justin Martyr around 165 AD, chapter 108 of his work. A godless and lawless heresy has sprung from one Jesus, a Galilean deceiver, who, whom we crucified. This was written by one of the priests and quoted by Justin Martyr. Uh, but his disciples stole him by night from the tomb where he was laid, went um, unfastened from the cross, and now deceived men by asserting he has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. Remember, the other, they couldn't even get their lies straight. Okay, here the disciples stole them. The other ones, the gardeners stole them. So why not produce a body? I've already said that. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, well, eight. In, in Acts alone, there's over eight times that you see the preaching of the resurrected Christ. Paul preaches the resurrected Christ for an entire message in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, unlike the lies, the message of the Christian apostles and all those that followed were what? Very consistent. It was the same message over and over again. Jesus was killed. He rose from the dead. He is alive now. He's at the right hand of the Father. We saw him rise into heaven. Everybody preached the same thing. Why would they do that? Why would they perpetrate a lie? Uh, and here's one, one last one. It's on hallucination theory. And I'm sorry. Um, only take a minute. <coughs> Gary Haberman, oh, Habermas, is an American theologian, theologian, wrote in Strobel, 1998, page 239. Hallucinations are comparably rare. This The theory is that they all hallucinated. The strain was so much because of the persecution that they hallucinated that they saw Jesus. Hallucinations are comparably rare. They're usually caused by drugs or bodily deprivation. Uh, chances are you don't know anybody who's ever had a hallucination not caused by one of these two things. Yet we're supposed to believe that over a course of many weeks, people from all sorts of backgrounds, all kinds of temperaments, in various places, all experience hallucination. That strains the hypothesis quote uh, quite a bit, doesn't it? That's what he, he asked. And then Sir William Ramsey was one time an unbeliever, world-class archaeologist. He uh, wrote a treatise about the Book of Acts. Remember I told you the Book of Acts was probably the one that they least respected, archaeologists respected. And he writes, i got a quote here, but I'm not going to read it all, but he says, the most conservative theological scholars, as a rule, thought the wisest plan of defense for the New Testament as a whole was to say as little as possible about the Acts. He was an unbeliever when he became an archaeologist. He eventually became a Christian because of what he kept finding. What he kept finding was confirmation after confirmation after confirmation that Luke's writings were as accurate as anything he's ever found in historical tones and then compared to archaeological dig. This is what he said, and then I close with this. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historians, and the and the stand, and they would stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest testament. And then he added, provided that the people doing the, the testing were doing it fairly <laughs> and not in a biased way. And that's why he became a Christian, because the truth is incontrovertible. The same message was preached from the very beginning to today. It hasn't changed. Christ raised from the dead. He is alive today, as alive as he's ever been. And there is no way that anyone can prove that there wasn't, because from the very beginning, there was the empty tomb. And the empty tomb is still there, and our Christ is still here. That is the lesson today. I, again, apologize for rolling in here late. I will try to do better. Uh, let's bow and ask our Lord to hear us during our, our worship service. Our God.
God, our Heavenly Father, praise for your name upon all the earth. You are great in you. We worship you. And we ask that uh, you hear our prayers, Lord, not because of any merits we may have, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about your resurrected son, the reason we stand, the reason we believe, the reason we live. Father, Lord, go with us now that the um, worship that we're about to offer to you be pleasing in your sight. Guide our hearts, guide our minds. Uh, be with us in all that we do. Forgive our sins and hear our prayers. In Christ. Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs>